but now they are they are now in okay uh, shall I um, well uh, I'm going to start uh, so good afternoon to our distinguished speakers guests colleagues uh, ladies and gentlemen I'm uh, Astri and I'm the vice dean for I would say um, non-academic so anything uh, about non-academic and I'm here uh, representing the dean of school of public health or faculty of public health Universitas Indonesia uh, Prof Sabarina who is now she has another uh, task to do okay so um, it's a blessed day that we can all be here to attend a wonderful uh, webinar. Although today uh, we have uh, heavy rain. I don't know uh, in your places, but in, in my place it's uh, raining so heavily. Uh, allow me to express uh, our gratitude to the honorable speakers, <clears throat> the moderator, and all individuals that have made all efforts so that this webinar session could be held. Um, today, our webinar uh, will present uh, about uh, mental health and, and psychology. Uh, so this is Ibu Rita's uh, expertise. Um, so we will have Professor Sharon Burns, PhD, Nice to meet you, Professor Sharon. Uh, so you are the uh, Director of uh, Health Promotion and Sexology School of Public Health, uh, Curtin University in Australia. Uh, nice to meet you. And uh, the topic will be mainstreaming mental health in public health. That is a very uh, interesting topic. And then, as uh, Iburita mentioned earlier, uh, we have Dr. Ruth uh, M. H. Peters. She is an assistant professor uh, in Athena Institute, Faculty of Earth and Life Sciences, Ray University. Uh, but she is not uh, joining us yet now. Uh, she's going to, to discuss or talk about stigma, what matter most. And then we also have uh, Professor uh, Irwanto, PhD, uh, from the Faculty of uh, Psychology at Majaya uh, Indonesian Catholic University. Uh, nice to meet you. Senang bertemu dengan Bapak, ya, Bapak Profesor Irwanto, uh, dengan topik uh, Developing Inclusive uh, Community. This is also a very um, interesting uh, topic. Um, so, uh, but I think without further ado, I would like uh, to open this uh, webinar session <clears throat> uh, officially. Um, knock, knock, knock. And then to pass this to uh, Ibu Rita Damayanti as the moderator of this uh, <clears throat> webinar. Uh, thank you and enjoy the webinar. Um, I'm sorry that I couldn't uh, stay in this uh, webinar, although this, these are very uh, interesting uh, topics, but I have a, a workshop also to, uh, to lead. So um, I'm going to be here for a while and then uh, I would uh, be. Thank you. And please, uh, Ibu Rita Damayanti, uh, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Astri, uh, for a very warm opening speech and a good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Yossi Marin Marpau, and on behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome you on today's webinar. And I'd like to also uh, yeah, welcome Professor Dr. Astri Adisa Smith as Vice Dean of Faculty of Public Health Universitas Indonesia and our distinguished speakers. There's been a great interest in today's webinar. I believe by this morning, at least, we already have more than 300 registrants, consisting of students, lecturers, researchers, consultants, and psychologists all around Indonesia. 
And based on the organizations attending here also participants from many universities all over Indonesia, there is also Pertamina, LIPI, participants from community health centers, or we can call it Puskesmas, the National Population and Family Planning Board, and many more. Some of them are with us at the moment in the Zoom. Others, I believe, are following the live streaming through YouTube ITF KMUI, and more, I believe, will come soon to the platform. Therefore, I'd like to welcome again to you all who are joining online now, and also for those of you that are joining in at a later time. So the theme for today's webinar is mental health and disability in public health perspective. This is a very interesting and a very important topic for us to learn together today, as we may already know that the issues of mental health are increasing worldwide. And not only that mental problems occur within adults group, but also in children and adolescents. Disability is also one of the risk and products of mental health conditions, also has resulted in overwhelming gaps in many aspects of life. Therefore, this important webinar is brought to you by Faculty of Public Health, Universitas Indonesia. And with us today, we already have distinguished and prominent speakers in the field from the very southern part of the world, Australia, to Indonesia, to the northern part of the world, the Netherlands. The session of today's webinar will also be moderated by one of our beloved lecturers in the faculty, Ibu Dr. Rita Damayanti. Before we are heading to the session, I would like to remind all the participants to not forget filling the attendance form at tiny.cc slash presency seminar online six. Again, tiny.cc slash presency seminar online six. The committee will also distribute the link during the webinar. And you can also ask the question through the webinar at the Q&A column, and please indicate to which speaker you would like to ask. The moderator will indicate the detail of Q&A and facilitate the Q&A session for you. And now I would like to welcome and briefly introduce to you Dr. Rita Damayanti, MSPH, who will be the moderator today. Dr. Rita Damayanti is a senior lecturer of health education and behavioral science, as well as head of public health doctoral program at the Faculty of Public Health, Universitas Indonesia. She is also the director of Center for Health Research, Universitas Indonesia, and the chairman of IHS, uh, HPE, or Indonesian Society for Health Promoter and Educator. Without further ado, let's begin the session. The screen and the time to you, Ibu Rita. Yeah, thank you very much, Yoshi, for your nice introductions, <laughs> our short CV. <laughs> okay. Uh, and now, um, let me introduce, I think I don't have to introduce uh, Professor Sharon because she's already famous, yeah. And then Ibu Asri also already also mentioned about your uh, reputation, yeah. So I think uh, we will give uh, Ibu Sharon, yeah, time to present uh, the topics, yeah, about mental health, yeah, in public health perspective. 30 minutes, Ibu Sharon. Yeah, and then after that, we go to the uh, question and answers. Okay, so the time is yours, Ibu Sharon. Thank you, Dr. Rita. And I'll try and share my, I'm just going to try and share my screen now. So hopefully this will work. Okay, can you see the slides? Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. Great. Okay, thank you. So my presentation today is going to look at mental health prevention and promotion and a public as a public health priority. And when we were discussing this seminar, um, my my focus was to take a very universal approach and to look at mental health prevention and promotion. Some of the other speakers will look a little bit more at hospitalizations and mental health treatment, and I think Dr. Ruth is going to look at stigma and talk about stigma. So I'm going to provide a bit of a brief introduction to what mental health prevention and promotion means and why mental health is such a big issue in for public health. So why is mental health a public health issue? We probably all know that people with mental health problems are likely to experience lots and lots of different sorts of health-related issues especially discrimination, stigma, and human rights violations. They're also more likely to experience physical health issues. So people with mental health-related issues often have comorbidity. 
sometimes the mental health issues come before the physical health issues. Sometimes they come after the physical health issues. But what we do know is that globally, people have more pro who have mental health problems also have more physical health problems. So that puts lots and lots of pressure on the healthcare system, which is something that we're very concerned with in public health because we obviously don't want to be putting so much pressure on the health system. What's really important when we consider mental health is that globally, more than 80% of people experiencing mental health conditions don't have access to quality, affordable health care. And this is really important because a lot of mental health problems can be prevented or they, they incidents can be reduced, so the severity can be reduced. And there's lots of different interventions and programs that can work with people. And mental health is a little bit different to some physical health issues in that a lot of people live with mental health issues for a long period of time. So that's contributing to a lot of disability. So that's a lot of life, years of life lost when we're considering public health related issues. Okay, so from a global perspective, suicide mortality is also high. So I've just mentioned that mental health is an issue for disability in terms of years of life loss. So loss of productivity, loss of being in the workforce, um, having to go to hospital or clinics. But it's also an issue in terms of mortality. Um, and particularly when we look at young people and also elderly women, and especially in lower middle income countries are disproportionately high. And I found that statistic quite interesting because it's also quite high in high income countries, but that the fact that it's quite, is disproportionately high in lower to middle income countries. So it's an increasing issue. For people who are impacted by humanitarian crises and other adversities, so sexual violence, interpersonal violence, mental health problems are, are really common. And I guess in today's society, we're seeing lots of increases in mental health problems globally as a result of COVID-19. So people are impacted as a result of COVID-19 because they may have been impacted financially, so they may not be able to work or they may, may um, not have, in, have lost their jobs, um, or because their family and friends are impacted by COVID-19. So we're seeing lots of deaths, lots of people um, having to support family members, and that all contributes to high mental health problems. So the World Health Organization has recognized mental health as being a really important issue. And I should say that mental health issues haven't received, have, it wasn't until the early 2000s in Australia that mental health problems started to receive the attention that physical health problems have received. So for many, many decades, we've spent a big focus on physical health problems, on communicable and non-communicable diseases and put a lot of attention. So in Australia and also in other parts of the world globally, it wasn't until the early 2000s that we started to get special initiatives and special programs targeting mental health. So mental health has lagged behind a little bit. Um, I've put this initiative up and you can Google this and find this full, the full document. So the World Health Organization Special Initiative for Mental Health provides a goal to provide universal health coverage for mental health. So before I mentioned that 80% of the population doesn't have good coverage or quality mental health care or access to mental health care. And so this initiative is looking at how we can work globally to try and make sure that more people get good health care. So the, the target is by 2023, 20, which is only two years, access to mental health care for 100 million more people is available globally, which is a really important goal. I've put up a slide about sustainable development goals because I think it's really important to remember that mental health is, is a key for a lot of sustainable development goals. So when we look across our sustainable development goals, most of the goals will have some sort of impact on mental health. And even though some of the goals focus on physical health and environmental health related issues, most of them will have mental health as an underpinning, um, an underpinning issue. 
which links into my next comment that mental health is complex and there are many positive and negative influences. So when we talk about mental health, we need to recognize those complexities. And we need to recognize this is lots of different factors that might influence mental health. So it's not an easy issue to address. It's very complex. And often we need to look at working with different systems with different organisations and different groups because it's not just about health. So there's a lot of other factors that we work with. So we might work with education, we might work with agriculture to make sure that people have access to good food because they don't have access to good food supplies that can impact their mental health. We, might, we are working on climate change because climate change related issues like we've just had big bushfires in near Perth that creates a lot of mental health related issues. 83 people lost their, 83 families lost their homes. So that creates lots and lots of issues. People have lost homes and incomes. So mental health is really complex. So it's not an easy issue. It's what we might call a wicked public health problem, but it's a really important public health problem. And it's also influenced by the determinants of health. And we could spend another whole session looking at determinants of health. So I'm not going to go into all of the determinants, but it's, it's important to recognize that the biological, social, economic, environmental and political determinants all impact mental health. And there's been a lot of work done to, to recognize those interactions. So particularly social determinants of health, and a lot of you will be work will recognise the work of Sir Michael Marmot and um, Professor Rich Wilkinson on their social determinants of health. And social determinants of health are particularly important to consider when we talk about mental health, because issues like inclusion, employment, unemployment, a big social gradient underpin mental health. And there's been some really nice studies that show that, you know, we need to be to have employment, we need to be, have some control in our employment, um, we need to have, be included, we need to have social inclusion, all of those sorts of things are such important protective factors for mental health. So thinking back to mental health prevention and promotion, they're the types of things that we can work on and to make a change and to make a difference. And I've popped those documents up because if you Google those documents as well, the World Health Organization document on social determinants of mental health is a really useful resource as well. Okay, and this little diagram just shows a really rough sketch of some of the interactions associated as, that might impact our social determinants of health and particularly our mental health. So there's lots of different factors. And I said before that mental health is complex and there's lots of things that we need to be focusing on. So we need to be focusing on access to hospitals, but we also need to be focusing on our family, on housing, on education. Um, there's lots of impacts associated with discrimination, particularly if we're looking at gender and sexual orientation, um, but also disability, racism, so many different sorts of impacts. And the framework for analysis of social determinants of health helps us explain a little bit more as well and looks at the impacts in a broader um, context. So considering the impacts of globalization, which is incredibly important for public health, we've had some, have some really positive impacts of globalization um, in terms of being able to change, to share technologies, to gather resources, to mobilize. Um, but globalisation can also put some negative pressures on as well. Um, and that's important to recognise. So looking at the impacts of globalisation, the impacts of health systems, how we all work together to look at some of those changes and some of the things that we need to think about when we're looking at, at um, changing health and particularly mental health. So looking at the difference between different mental health related interventions and different mental health related and how we explain I find the spectrum of interventions really useful to help explain the chain the differences so Masaryk and Haggerty's model of the spectrum of interventions for mental health look at the continuum of mental health and what I really like about this diagram is that it shows that it's a 
a continuum and that people can move from one aspect to the other, which is why it's really imp important that people that work in prevention, early intervention, treatment and continuing care all work together and we look at it as a big picture. So it's not just about providing hospitals, clinics, it's also about providing prevention and early intervention, community care, there's a whole spectrum. So looking at the spectrum, mental health promotion runs along the bottom of the spectrum because that is looking at how we promote good mental health. It also looks at how we promote programs and interventions for people who might be caring with people with mental health or for targeting people who might be consumers of mental health. So that's why mental health promotion runs along the whole spectrum. Our prevention programs are divided into selective, indicated and universal. And I'll talk about that in a, little, in a little while. And you'll see that early intervention runs across from prevention to treatment because people that are entering early intervention programs might have some signs of mental health problems or some very early mental health problems. Um, and they may be starting treatment. So it might be early stages of treatment. And you'll see that the spectrum looks at treatment in different ways. So early stages, the case identification, which is our early stages of treatment, our early treatment, standard treatment, and then we go into continuing care and longer term care. But recognising that people may move in and out of that spectrum. And often people with mental health related problems may um, suffer from a mental health problem for a while then they move back along the continuum but then they move may move back to need more treatment so it is a continuing issue when we're looking at mental health related issues so universal prevention focuses on targeting the general public or the whole population group that hasn't been identified on the basis of individual risk so whole community programs and i'm going to talk about two programs that have that are universal um, at the, right at the end. I'll do a really quick um, introduction to two programs. But school-based programs are a good example of universal because when we go into schools, we target the whole population. School-based programs may also have aspects of selected and indicated programs as well though, so I'll talk about that. Um, Community-based programs, so programs that might be trying to reduce levels of stigma about a specific mental health problem or it might be trying to promote good mental health. And one of the programs that I'm going to talk about is aiming to try and promote good mental health amongst the whole population. So Universal targets everyone, regardless of whether we have a mental health issue or not. Selective programs target individuals or a subgroup who are, who are at risk of developing mental health disorders is significantly higher than average. So I'm using some Australian examples because that's what I know. So in Australia, um, some our Indigenous population suffer greater levels of mental health problems because they might be more discriminated against, they may be more socially isolated, um, employment levels are lower. So there's a whole range of factors that might make them more at risk of mental health related problems. So selective programs might target, for example, Indigenous young people and look at trying to provide job opportunities. So not all of our programs target specific health issues. They might be targeting one of the determinants. So we might be looking at employment opportunities, how to skill young people, provide them with some skills and some, some resources to help them do that. Um, you'll see a picture of a man standing in front of some sheep. It's a little bit small, but in Australia, Rural males, and particularly um, males who are farmers, suffer greater mental health problems than the rest of the population. So they're another group that we might target with specific interventions. So rural males suffer mental health problems for a greater, a, at a greater rate than the rest of the population because of social isolation. So in Australia, our farms are getting bigger and our communities are getting smaller and we live in quite a, a vast country. So sometimes people may not have as many social connections as what they have previously. We also suffer from drought um, and sometimes floods and bushfires, which uh, are um, environmental determinants, which can then impact, which impact people's mental health, particularly when we look at financial issues. 
Okay, and the other person is a, a young person who is pregnant. So um, we obviously have a, a range of issues when we, if people, um, pregnancy is a, a wonderful time, but for some people it may um, generate some mental health problems. And we certainly know that postnatal depression um, is one of our one of the issues that we focus on quite a lot when we're looking at selective basis based programs. So we might be looking at young people who are pregnant or older people or, or anyone who's pregnant because they might be at a higher risk of developing a mental health problem than the rest of the population. Okay, and our indicated programs target high risk individuals who have minimal but detectable signs and symptoms of a disorder or they might have some biological markers indicating a predisposition for mental health disorder. So some of the work that I've done has been in schools and particularly focusing on bullying. So in our schools, we have bullying programs that are universal. So we might all target everyone and we'll do some work in curriculum. We might do some other work um, in the school environment to make the school environment more positive. Um, we'll train some teachers, we may do some work with parents. So we're doing those sorts of things for everyone. So that's universal. Then we might have some kids who might have some selective programs. So some kids that may suffer from low self-esteem that may have poor communication skills. So they don't have any mental health problems, but we can see there's some things there that might make them at higher risk of being bullied and then developing some mental health problems. So we target those people. Then we may have some indicated kids. So there's a lot of data that shows that if someone has, if, if a young kid is being aggressive around kindy, kindy pre-primary age, then they're more likely to develop bullying behaviours and they're also more likely to suffer from mental health related problems. So those indicated programs might be targeting those kids in kindy who are showing some behavioural problems and not interacting well. So that's an example of an indicated program. Okay, and then our early interventions are programs for people who are displaying early signs and symptoms of a mental health problem or a mental disorder, or people developing and experiencing a final episode of a mental health disorder. So a lot of early intervention programs would be run by psychologists and might include cognitive behavioural therapy. There might be group sessions. So if we're looking at the school example, um, our early intervention programs probably wouldn't be run in a school, but we might be referring some kids in our school to a, a, a program. So they might go to an anger management program um, that's run outside of the school. So early interventions cross over into prevention because sometimes we're running programs that might be um, indicated early intervention. There is a little bit of a crossover. So that gives you a little bit of an understanding of the key aspects of prevention and early inter intervention from the spectrum framework. And I'm not going to talk about treatment and continuing care because that um, I'll, I'll leave that for other people to talk about. But my focus has been mental health promotion and prevention. So I've focused on, on that aspect. So I mentioned before, mental health promotion runs across the whole spectrum. So it looks at trying to promote positive mental health. Um, it also looks at trying to reduce stigma. Um, it looks at promoting well-being amongst people who are currently well, those that are, are at risk and those that are experiencing illness. So it's running along the whole spectrum. Okay, and mental health prevention is around trying to identify people or groups of people so that we can specifically target interventions, so that we can make our interventions better. If we know who we're targeting, then we're much more likely to have a successful intervention. Okay, and the prevention interventions occur before the initial onset of a disorder or during the really early stages of a disorder when there's some signs and symptoms. Because what we want to do is we want to stop that disorder developing or we want to um, maintain or you know, reduce the severity of that disorder. Okay, so there's lots of different mental health prevention and promotion interventions. I'm not going to talk about lots of interventions. I'm going to just focus on two interventions 
Um, some of the logos that I've put up there are examples of programs that we have in Australia. So the Friendly Schools Program is an example of bullying prevention programs. Um, respect, one, 180 Respect is a domestic violence program or interpersonal violence program. And Beyond Blue um, is a really useful website. So you can Google Beyond Blue and you will find the website. It has lots of different resources. Beyond Blue offers some universal programs, but also some selective and indicated programs. Uh, lots of good resources for health professionals, for teachers, for the general public. Um, and it has programs that target all the, the whole spectrum of ages from early childhood through to elderly. Okay, the other two programs I'm going to talk about briefly. So Act Belong Commit is a, is a community-based campaign that's run through Curtin University. Okay, it's essentially a media camp, or it's it, one component is a media campaign. So we have some media ads. Okay, but what Act Belong Commit is trying to do is to promote good, positive mental health for the whole community. So it's an example of a universal program, although we do have some selected and indicated strategies. And the aim of the program is to get people to act, to do something. So there's lots of different strategies that are getting people involved to go for a walk or a run, to read a book, to talk to someone, to meet, meditate or pray. To belong, to do something with someone. And that's all about connectedness and make, making sure people are connected. And also to commit, to do something meaningful. So it sounds fairly simple. Um, the message is very simple because it needs to be simple for a, a universal-based program. Sorry. Um, and and as we have, have a range of different sorts of resources and different sorts of, of programs. Probably the most important thing about the program is that we, we work with lots of different organisations. So we work with schools, we work with community groups, uh, we work with Indigenous groups, we work with sports groups, with arts groups, um, a whole range of different sorts of groups to help promote the message. So there's some very simple messages. There's some things that organisations can do. Um, sometimes it's just about raising the awareness and letting people know where they can go for help. Um, sometimes it's more about doing actual strategies. So the schools programs do, um, you know, we'll, we'll work with them to develop curriculum to have specific programs that might come into their schools. Um, some of the sports clubs might also have some specific programs that come in. Um, we work with ch church groups. So a whole range of different sorts of programs and partners. And I think the program has almost around 100 different partners that they work with. So it's very structured. There's some simple activities that people can do or some simple strategies that people can do. There's a, a little tool that people can link on to to look at whether they're at risk of mental health problems and then some support for where you might go for support. So it is essentially a, a universal program around promoting good mental health. However, it also does focus on getting help for people if they need it. So pointing people in the right direction for where to go to for help. And this is just an example of some of the different sorts of strategies. So, as I said, we work strongly with schools and community groups, but we also work with arts groups, with Indigenous groups, with sports groups, um, music groups, um, to try and promote positive mental health, but also to provide resources and support for people so that they know where to go and where to seek help. Okay, and I have put the website up there for that one. So I've just given you a really brief introduction. So have a look at the website because there's lots of information on the website. And the other program that we run at Curtin is the Relationships and Sexuality Education Project. So this program provides support for teachers and for schools. And I've put the link for that project up here as well. And this program focuses quite a lot on sexuality education, but we've put relationships first because relationships are probably the most important thing when we're looking at, at 
at schools and working with kids and mental health related issues. So we focus a lot on, on relationship type issues like communication, bullying, um, so very much universal type prevention programs that might be targeting young people. So this program has been funded through Curtin by WA Health since um, 2014, so it's been going for a little while. Um, we have a range of different sorts of evaluations that we've conducted on the program. Our main focus, our main strategy is to train teachers um, and to, to um, measure the impact of the project on schools. So as part of our program, we train teachers, but we also have a case study approach which allows us to evaluate the school, um, evaluate the program at a whole school level. And that allows schools to be able to implement a whole range of strategies in the curriculum, in the environment, and with parents and community. Okay, so this is just some pictures, some pictures of our teachers who have attended some of our training sessions. Okay, and some of the training sessions happening. Okay, and this is just a picture of, um, to give you a bit of a, an example of the scope of Western Australia. So Western Australia is fairly big. We sit directly below Indonesia. So we're pretty close to Indonesia. We sit on the same timeline as Bali and we're one hour time difference from Jakarta. We have case study schools um, in the Perth metropolitan area, which I'm just pointing my little pointer at. I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, in some low socioeconomic areas. So one of our schools is in Safety Bay, which is actually in right, quite nice, um, right near the, the beach, but it is in fairly low socioeconomic not economic area. And they came to us because they have a lot of domestic or family, domestic and family or interpersonal violence happening in their school community. And they wanted to try and improve things. And so as part of our program, we've provided training to teachers, but we've also worked with the school and lots of other organisations around the school. So we work with um, Headspace, which is a youth mental health related community agency. We do lots of work with the police and the police have been really good because the police are one of the people that identified that this was an issue because lots they were going to lots of interpersonal violence incidents in the town or in the, the area and kids were coming to school and were being violent at school. So they were learning violent behaviors at home and the police were really concerned. And the community had a fairly negative attitude towards police. So police want to increase their approachability to kids as well. So we do quite a lot of work with police. Um, so there's been lots of different sorts of strategies that have helped bring that community together. And we're doing some evaluation on that at the moment. We've done some um, pre-testing and now we're doing some post-testing. So hopefully we'll have some results out, but we've done a few little evaluations on some of our projects. One of our projects was police officers coming in and doing some jiu-jitsu programs with some of the at-risk kids. So more of a selected indicated type program. And that's worked, worked really well. Those kids have had better attendance at school um, less, pro less um, issues at school, so they've been in trouble less at school, and they've also been improving their academic grades. So I've had been really pleased with some of those initiatives. One of our other areas that we work with is Robin, and Robin's right up here near Port Hedland, um, and that's largely an Indigenous school, and that has lots of different challenges. So you can see a picture of the town, it's pretty remote, some really nice areas around it but it is stuck in the middle of, of um, the deserts almost um, and and they have a, they have a range of different sorts of issues particularly again interpersonal violence um, a lot of sexual assaults um, a lot of family dysfunction and they also have quite a nomadic school environment so kids don't always attend school they come to school sometimes so they have lots of challenges so we're working with them as well to develop some strategies that are really specific to their school so that not some some of those strategies wouldn't be appropriate for anyone else so that's important to remember too that 
to try and think about strategies that might be specific to that school. And I'm conscious I'm just about out of time. So that's just a picture of some of our kids from Safety Bay. So Safety Bay is a high school. Breakfast club is pretty important in some of our schools because some of our kids come to school with no breakfast, especially from the lower socioeconomic areas. Okay, and um, again, some pictures of Safety Bay and getting their Indigenous kids involved in some Indigenous dances. That school also has a really high proportion of Maori and Samoan kids. So Maori from New Zealand and Samoan from the um, Pacific Islands. And this is some pictures of our kids at Roburn. So um, again, involving the community, doing some programs that connect, that bring people in together. Okay, so that's just a summary of our Relationships and Sexuality Education Project. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Herin, for your inspiring presentations. Yeah, it's uh, make us um, realize that uh, working in mental health is very complex. Yeah, very, Especially, yeah, <laughs> very, and it, uh, a, a very wide spectrums. Yeah, to in, mm. to make interventions. Mm. Yeah, okay. So I think we cannot work uh, alone, but we should uh, get together with NGOs also. Yeah. Okay, uh, before uh, question and answers, I would like to introduce uh, our new uh, majoring, yeah? So these seminars is kind of like a promotion for all of you, uh, the attendees, yeah? That uh, in uh, Faculty of Public Health, Universitas Indonesia, we already have um, community mental health and disability majoring, yeah? It's under health education and behavior department. And as you know, uh, Professor Irwanto is uh, one of the persons that uh, invest a lot of time yeah, to support us to, to make this uh, uh, majoring. Yeah? So if uh, some of you um, will, uh, would like to join the um, master program, it's a master program, yeah? you can join and uh, it's under uh, our department, Department of Health Education and Behavior Science. Okay, so uh, there's a one question. This is a question from our uh, PhD students. Yeah. Uh, hi, Professor Sherid, I'm Lastri. What do you think about psychoeducation for pregnant mother who give who given by midwife to promote mental health well-being? Yeah, I think this is uh, his. Um, kind of like a project dissertation yes. and then you can give a comment about it. Yeah, Thank I you. think that's that's very important. I didn't talk so much about um, pregnant mom, mothers. I did mention a little bit about postnatal depression, but I think it, that's a really important target group. Um, we have some projects that we're focused on breastfeeding. Um, one of the projects that I'm involved in is, is focused on breastfeeding, but we also do some, we, we are also looking at some mental health related strategies for pregnant mums and new mums and also fathers as well because fathers suffer postnatal depression as well we're now finding. So I think that's a really important program. It's a big target group and we know that there's a lot of people that never have a mental health problem but as soon as they become pregnant, they start developing mental health problems. So it's a very important group to target yeah so as uh, you know uh, professor sharon said in indonesia uh, for pregnant mothers usually we all always think about their physically yeah kind of like yes. uh, hemoglobin yeah, yeah, antenatal care yeah but uh, psychological uh, uh, problems is kind of like rather neglected Okay. Yes, so, it, yeah, um, it's very important. And there's some, there's some good worldwide scales. So the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale um, is a really simple thing that doctors can do, run through with mothers. So um, some doctors will do that as a standard practice. Um, and that then gives a really good indication of whether they need some more help. But it doesn't happen all the time, unfortunately. Yet it's a simple thing that they can do. Okay. Uh, so uh, last three, 
maybe we can ask uh, Professor Sherin to to help you in your dissertations and then uh, yeah. Be, uh, uh, yeah, one of us. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next a uh, question is uh, next question is about the uh, I cannot see. Uh, okay, it's very small. Oh yeah, this is I'm a uh, Puspita from Sehat Jiwa. Yeah. Since uh, 2018, we are trying to develop well-being curriculum to enhance mental health condition. But most of the time, it's really hard to make the system to realize about the importance of mental health prevention. Because in Indonesia, people still look mental health as a pill that they should took when the problem already severe, in our opinion. How to accelerate the impact of prevention program with all of the stigmatizations and return of investment that we cannot see the directly right after the program? Yeah, this is, I think, a health promotions problem is always yes. like this. Yeah? <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay, that is it. That is a big problem. It is a big problem. And, you know, I mentioned earlier on that mental health hasn't received the attention that physical health has for that reason, that there's been a lot of stigma and associated with it. And that, that and, and some countries, um, and, and certainly even in Australia, we didn't start to work on mental health prevention and promotion until the, you know, late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, I think it is an issue for health promotion. So it's about advocating and putting that, that data out there. If you go to the World Health Organization website, there's lots of good data about mental health and why mental health is such a big problem globally. And we're seeing a lot more data now from um, all countries, from low, middle and high income countries that show that mental health issues are increasing and they're increasing even more in low to middle income countries because there often isn't the support. And so I think advocating for that change, putting together some figures and taking them to people to help support. You can also show examples of things that have been done in other countries as well that have had success. So I'm not sure whether the curriculum was for schools or for university or what area. If it's for schools, I can get... get um, Dr. Rita, to give Dr. Rita your email and I can send you some things that have been done in other countries that might help and that might help your argument. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Professor. The chat, yeah? Okay. Actually, Professor Sharon. Okay. Sharon has thank a you. Uh, and then uh, the next question. Okay, the next question is this is a, a honest a question here yeah, from Fifi. Yeah, I've been thinking so far that mental health problems is apparently correlated to the human personality. What do you think about that? Could we his or her personality. Thank you. Okay, so when, when we look at mental health related issues, I, I said they were quite complex. Um, and some of you might be aware of social socio-ecological model. That's sometimes a good way to think about it. So some mental health related issues are associated with our genetics. So if our family member is has a mental health problem, we might be more likely to have a mental health problem. And there's certainly some personality related issues that might be associated with mental health problems. So some people are more likely to become anxious, more likely to become depressed because of their personality. And some of those problems can actually be worked with. So some cognitive behavioral therapy address some of those issues. However, there's also a whole range of other issues. And that's why I said it was really complex. So there's a whole range of other issues that might impact as well. So Things in the environment can impact, like whether you like what's actually happening. So there's a lot of triggers that might impact mental health related issues. So you know, natural disasters, 
um, discrimination, um, disenfranchisement, all of those sorts of things might impact as well. So that that can impact. Um, there's also a whole range of um, broader factors that can impact as well. So I think it's important to think of it as a very complex problem. Um, there are some things that can be done at an individual level, um, but there's also some things that need to be done at a broader societal level as well. I hope that answered your question because it's it is quite a complex problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question is uh, from Rati Bulandari. Is it about COVID? Yeah. So during pandemic yep. COVID-19, most of the workers group and students have to work from home or schools from home, which will lead to psychological burden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, the things that we uh, make it yes. today, seminars yeah, from home. Yeah. And uh, is there any case study who how many percent psychological cases during a uh, COVID pandemic and which group affected most? And based on your experience, what is the best program to prevent mental illness during a pandemic? Yeah. Okay, that's a hard, that's a hard question. <laughs> I, I do know there's lots of studies that are being done on the prevalence of mental health during COVID. Um, we've collected some data through a big survey um, with lots of other countries. We haven't actually finished analysing our data. So when we do that, we'll publish it and we'll have some data on mental health problems. But I know there has been some published. And um, some of the journal articles, if you do a journal search, particularly through JAMA, um, are quite good on looking at mental health related issues because there's been studies that have shown certainly that mental health related problems have increased. Um, some groups from our early look at our studies, some groups have been disproportionately affected. So particularly people that were already a little bit marginalized or feeling socially isolated were more likely to be impacted people that were living by themselves or didn't have good family support were more likely to be impacted impacted. Um, regarding the intervention, um, I'm not too sure at the moment because that's something that I think people are working on. There have been some people have been providing some strategies, so some individual coping strategies and things like that. So I think that's important. Um, staying connected is important. So I think um, some of the programs have been focusing on making sure people stay connected to their friends. So it might be having Zoom parties instead of ordinary parties and those sorts of things. But it is a very new area for all of us. And, you know, I think a really important area where, um, it, and, and I think it'll be important to looking at different responses in different countries and how um, the different levels of lockdown and severity of COVID impact mental health because we're a little bit fortunate here in Australia that we haven't had um, big numbers, but we've got a nice case study in Australia because Melbourne has, or Victoria have had a lot more lockdowns than Western Australia. So we can compare what's happened here compared to what's happened there. But um, certainly I know in lots of other countries, it's been very difficult. So I think we'll be seeing lots more data around it and a lot more programs that come out of it. Thank you. Yeah, so um, we also uh, have kind of like a small study with the new mm -hmm. uh, students in UI. Yeah, because they have uh, 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 come to UI, at, it's already mm -hmm. uh, work from home. So, yeah, and then we ask uh, questions uh, to them. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, from the, the answers, yeah, they kind of like, they, they, uh, they experience very stressful with uh, yeah. Zoom. Yeah, especially mm -hmm. because the time difference. Yes. Because we have kind of like in the west and east, you know, they said that, okay, so we, we should have uh, discussions with the group, but actually already, it's already a, a bad time for them. Yes. You know? It's just <laughs> such like that. Yeah. But still, uh, because they are uh, young people, they can, uh, they have a very good coping behavior. See, yes. Yes. So yes. I think uh, it's still okay, but I hope that uh, the COVID will uh, fade away 
okay, yeah, maybe next year, I think, yeah. Yeah, okay. I think we'll see but some maybe... interesting studies, and especially around university students, yeah. because we've had the same experience with our students, and we haven't had to do all of our classes online, but, um, you know, in our first lockdown we did, and students, we found it difficult, and students found it difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is another uh, uh, questions from uh, Yuli Rostina. He is um, uh, working in a, a HIV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, so he, he said that uh, I'm a community health, community educator. Mostly work for people living with HIV. That mental health program among PLWHA is very rare. I yeah. have a little study among them that mentioned it was very challenging to access and to get the supply. Yeah. Uh, is it right that uh, you said that uh, mentions, I mean that uh, I can see mental health program is very, oh yeah, yeah. The program is very rare. It's, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, what is your comment, uh, Professor Sherrins? Sorry, I, I missed a little bit of what you said then. So um, he's working on a program with HIV positive yes. people. Yeah, so the program is very rare in, in here, I believe, yeah, in uh, for the uh, people with HIV. Yeah, and then uh, it's very challenging uh, to get access and then to get a supply. I believe it's about the supply, it's the uh, medicines and also the program. Uh, ah, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. Um, that's a hard question for me to answer too because I'm not that's sure. Really yeah, because it, it's a different context. Um, so mm -hmm. that is very difficult. I know that that's a very big issue. Um, one of my PhD students is doing some work with um, men who have sex with men and warrior people in Bali. And um, she's doing some of the early research and, and collecting some data and looking at some of those things and access to services. But I know quite a few of her contacts um, are non-government organisations. So they work directly with um, people with HIV and men who have sex with men. So it's more community-based contacts. Um, and I know some of them have had difficulty getting treatment as well and access to services, particularly over COVID. So I'm not sure what the answer is at the moment, but I do know that it is a big issue. And when um, my student, Septorini, publishes her results, we might have some more information to share with you. So sorry, I'm probably not very helpful with that one. Yeah, yeah, Australia. So there's a lack of a uh, uh, psychological pro uh, program for the people with HIV. Yes. Yes. Or maybe you are already in advanced stage. Sorry, can you say that again? Because you cut out a little bit. Yeah. So um, can you share about these conditions in Australia? I uh, mean, in Australia, uh, yes. Yeah. 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 So we've been reasonably fortunate in Australia during COVID that we haven't, that people have been able to access their medical treatment fairly well. So um, because we haven't had such a big pressure on hospitals as what other countries have, um, people have been still able to get there, and particularly HIV positive people have been still able to get their, their um, ART and, and other treatments. So we haven't had such a big issue. Some of our psychological services have been online. So um, we've changed from face-to-face -face appointments to phone appointments in some cases when we've had lockdowns and that's actually been quite successful so that's been a, a good initiative and a good outcome because a lot of people have felt quite comfortable with that service so it hasn't been so bad for us um, but I think that's associated with us not having our hospital system hasn't been as badly impacted as what other countries have because we haven't had really big cases. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, this is from uh, Arum Ariasi here. Yeah? Uh, mm. Is mental health promotion intervention in its implementations stand alone or integrated in other health fields? 
and how are the policies related to mental health in um, maternal. So I think it's related with the uh, uh, questions before. Yeah, yeah, look, that's a really important question and mental health policy is usually written as mental health policy. Um, however, um, a lot of other, it, it is very much integrated into other health related issues. And I don't think we should be looking at mental health in isolation or physical health problems in isolation, because I think when we look at a physical health problem, there's almost always a mental health related issue associated with it as well. So I think we should be integrating more. And that's starting to happen a little bit, um, but it's probably not happening as quickly as what we would like. So we've, you know, some of our work, our mental health commission in Western Australia also um, encompasses alcohol and other drugs as well. So they're combined now, but I think it should be a little bit broader. I think it should be other health issues as well, because it's very difficult to look in isolation. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Professor Sharon. I, I believe we uh, still have uh, some uh, questions, but I think uh, uh, Dr. Roots already with us now. Yeah, so maybe we uh, should move on to another uh, speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sharon. And I think we can um, make um, more collaborations with our department. Yes, yes. Since, uh, you already have a lot of experience with mental health. Uh, health promotions and we are the beginners yeah so uh, maybe you can that would be uh, great i would love to um, thank make, you yeah <laughs> okay thank you very much thank, uh, you. thank you and now um, we will move on uh, to dr ruth peters yeah dr ruth is uh, still very young yeah <laughs> but uh, she has a lot of experience yeah and then she will talk about a stigma yeah, about stigma, yeah, uh, in uh, disability, yeah. So the time is yours, Professor, uh, Dr. Ruth. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Ibu Sabarina and Ibu Rita for uh, inviting me to speak during this seminar. It's, um, uh, it's a really, it's a very big pleasure for me to speak to you all. Um, from 2010 to 2015, I, um, I traveled to Indonesia quite often and I stayed often a couple of months, but the last couple of years um, I was busy because I had two babies mm -hmm. and uh, I moved to the US for one and a half years. And then now there is COVID, so I haven't been uh, to Indonesia for way too long, but at least this feels like I'm a, I'm a little bit with you again. And uh, so I'm very, uh, very grateful. Um, saya juga mau minta maaf karena lima tahun lalu mungkin bahasa Indonesia masih cukup bagus untuk membawa lecture seperti ini dalam bahasa Indonesia. Tapi kalau saya di sini saya tidak praktek uh, dan um, lebih bagus kalau saya bicara bahasa Inggris uh, sekarang. Ya. Uh, also, another thing is that um, in the Netherlands, we have a lockdown, uh, as in many places right now, and I'm working from home. Uh, but on Thursdays, my two children are also in the house. And although I, they have clear instructions not to enter the living room, uh, my apologies. If at some point a toddler uh, <laughs> enters, um, it will be solved very quickly. But uh, just so you know, it's a bit, um, yeah, the situation right now, right? I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and I'm going to start a presentation about stigma. Uh, I hope you can see it. Uh, it's called stigma and what matters most. Okay. Um, so right now, let me just briefly introduce myself. So I'm a, an assistant professor at the Athena Institute at the Vrije University, uh, University in Amsterdam. And at this institute, what we try to do is we want to contribute to solving complex um, societal problems or challenges in a sustainable and equitable way. And we believe very strongly that we, in order to, to solve, to contribute to solving problems, we need to integrate knowledge from a, a whole range of uh, experts, right? Both um, scientists, 
from different scientific disciplines, but also uh, we like to involve non-scientific actors in our research. So what we, we call this type of research, transdisciplinary research. And I think this, um, uh, let me open the laser points. This uh, visualization shows this uh, nicely. So we, we really believe in this type of research where we work together with different disciplines and we very strongly work together with a non-academic environment. Yeah. All other types of research are also, I mean, we're not against other types of research, of course, they have their own purpose, but we believe to contribute to society, you know, complex problems, this is a really, uh, really an important um, form of research. Um, so the complex problem that I've been working on for the last decade is health-related stigma. And um, I like to start with a definition, just in case this is this concept is a bit new to you. So this is a, um, I think, a nice definition provided by Wise and colleagues. I'm going to read it out loud. Uh, a social, so health-related stigma is a social process experienced or anticipated, characterized by exclusion, rejection, blame, or devaluation that results from experience, perception, or reasonable anticipation of an adverse social judgment about a person or a group. So it's a mouthful. Um, but what I like you to sort of, uh, I, draw your, I like to draw your attention to a few aspects of this definition. First of all, that stigma is a social process. So it's not something like a static label or something. It's really um, a dynamic process that takes place in society. I also like to draw your attention to this part that it is experienced or anticipated. So sometimes people really, um, um, you know, they, they experience discrimination, for example. It's something they really experience. Anticipated is something they, um, right? For example, they somebody with a stigmatized condition might keep their illness secret for others because they anticipate what will happen if they disclose or they, they don't do certain things because of they, what they anticipate that will happen. So they don't go to the market because they think if I go, uh, people will gossip about me. They will take a distance. They will neglect me. Um, so they anticipate what will happen and they, um, and they stay home. Yeah. And I also like as a last point to yeah, draw your attention to these couple of words because I think it's just so, yeah, it shows what it's all about. It's about exclusion, rejection, blame, and very important, devaluation. Yeah, so these are just very important concepts connected to this definition. Okay. Um, so this is a question to you. What health conditions come to mind when you think about health-related stigma? I don't, I'm not sure if we have a chat function here that I can read. If so, you can sort of, uh, because I'm not sure, uh, let me see. If so, you can leave some um, ideas of in the chat, but otherwise just think for a bit, what kind of health conditions come to mind when you think about health-related stigma? Because it's a whole, you know, it's actually quite a lot. Yeah, yeah right, we have... Um, uh, oh. Because the audience cannot... Uh, no, uh, they answer. cannot, no. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. But then it's good to think just for a little bit to think about actually the range of conditions. So I will. I will just mention a few that you might have said. Right. You might have mentioned uh, mental health, of course, because this is uh, a key aspect of this seminar. Um, uh, mental illnesses, uh, but also HIV/AIDS. It's. Uh, you talked about this during the, the last presentation. Tuberculosis uh, can be a condition. Um, it can also be, um, for example, cancer. There are some uh, there are some stigma dynamics also in people that, um, that have cancer. Um, leprosy that's another it's a condition that I've worked on a lot. Um, there are stigma attached to it. Um, I was wonder I was just it's a question COVID nineteen. I was wondering how in Indonesia if people with COVID nineteen also experience or if there are some stigma dynamics going on there. Um, there is a whole wide range of uh, stigmatized conditions. Um, so it's quite a, yeah, it's an important problem. Um, I'm going to show you a theoretical framework. Uh, yes, this framework is called the Health 
stigma and discrimination framework. It was developed quite recently uh, by a group of um, stigma scholars. And I really like it. There are many things that I like about this framework. First of all, it's built up on, as you can see, the ecological levels, right? Um, stigma can operate at the individual level, at the interpersonal level, organizational level, community level, or the policy level. Um, it's one of the reasons why it is a complex problem because it's all, you know, it's operating on all these levels and it's also interconnected. Uh, so this, uh, this model appreciates this. Um, here in this model, you can see the drivers of stigma and the facilitators. Mm. They will differ per condition, right? So every condition will have different drivers. Uh, there, there can be some similarities, of course. Um, uh, but there are also uh, differences between conditions. Um, here you can see what is called stigma marking, but are, but are really these intersecting stigmas. Um, that's sort of your race, your gender, your sexual orientation. It will all sort of influence your experiences with stigma. Uh, here we can see the manifestations. Here we can see outcomes, and this will have the impact on health and um, our social well-being. Yeah. So during this lecture, I'm going to zoom in to three aspects on this model. We'll be talking about manifestations. I will share some results from one of the studies I was involved in. I will also talk about these intersecting stigmas. Uh, I will present some findings of one of my PhD students. And lastly, I will talk about these cultural norms, one of the facilitators, and I will be talking about a new project in which we use the What Matters Most framework. So this is a bit the agenda of the lecture. So first, uh, manifestations. Um, um, Yes, so from 2010 to 2015, uh, I was involved in the SARI project. SARI stands for Stigma Assessment and Reduction of Impact. This project uh, was executed in Chirabon district, as you can see on the map here. Um, so it's a very big project and um, uh, I, I can tell you more about this um, uh, during another time when we meet. Uh, also, Professor Erwanto and Iborita can tell you more about this because they were involved as um, investigators. Um, but I will be focusing on some of the qualitative data that we collected. So some of the interviews and the focus group discussions that we held in this um, area. And um, I just put some references for you if you'd like to read more. And there are more, but these are the, um, the articles in which we presented uh, some of the qualitative uh, findings. So I want to show you um, uh, through a, a series of quotes, different types of stigma that were there among people affected by leprosy. So this, this project was focusing on leprosy. Uh, so let's start with it. So first types of stigma. Yeah, so this was a woman and she told us, um, I was very embarrassed when I found out I had leprosy. So I never tell, and uh, I never tell others keeping silent is better. Yeah, so this is one, you could say manifestation of stigma, right? One um, that people decide to keep their illness um, secret, which is um, understandable because they are trying to avoid um, uh, discrimination, for example. But by doing this, they also carry a burden alone, right? So we, it's, um, it can also be very difficult for people, this uh, strategy to cope. Um, this is another uh, woman. She told us, um, I'm very sad and afraid. I feel alone. I feel a distance from my family. Actually, I like to help my family cooking, but I'm doubtful. Yeah. So these are examples of where we sort of can think more about internalized stigma. Yeah. So people um, feeling sad, alone, afraid. Yeah. I felt hopeless. If God had taken my life at that time, I would have accepted it gladly. gladly. So it's really, it shows, it's, it's really a big, it can be really a big problem for people. Stigma. 
So here we go into another type of stigma. This is what people really experienced, right? When people are gathering and chatting and I come over, those who don't not like me will stride off or go away. I stopped going to school because of my leprosy. My friends are always making fun of me. I feel ashamed and uncomfortable going there. I used to run a small business selling toys. Because of leprosy, I lost my customers and nobody buys my toys. Hence, my business is bankrupt. Yeah, so this goes more into experience, uh, experience stigma and discrimination, perhaps. Uh, another type of stigma, uh, I'm the one who feels ashamed. And my friends treat me as usual. They do not feel disgusted, but I cannot help feeling ashamed. I'm afraid they will avoid me. Right, so this is interesting. So actually, um, her friends are treating her as usual, but she has this, first of all, this internalized type of stigma. She feels ashamed. Um, and she is, has this anticipated type of stigma. She's afraid that others will avoid her. She's anticipating, or she's a like perceived stigma, is what we call this. Yeah, so you can see different types of stigma are, uh, you know, are there. Uh, among this group of people affected by leprosy. Uh, I also would like to draw your attention to uh, an important issue, uh, stigma from health professionals. I, um, yeah, because I think it's just so, it can be so impactful for people affected if their health professional is stigmatizing. Fortunately, I have to say, we also met many, you know, really wonderful health professionals um, uh, they did a really great do job and I was, you know, very impressed. But there was also this other side of the picture um, where stigmatization from health professionals did take place. And also people, you know, the, the health professionals themselves acknowledged this. So this is um, data from a focus group discussion with health professionals. The health worker still feels afraid, nervous. Actually, there are many health workers that feel so. Yeah, so they, they know that this is an issue among themselves. So they, they told us. And this is an interview or an, like an informal interview with a person affected by leprosy. The moment the leprosy worker, the Patukas Kusta, right, did not want to shake my hand. I had the feeling leprosy cannot be cured and that people will not be friendly with me anymore. Yeah, it's just this very important source of stigma. Though, as I said, there are also um, uh, very good examples where we can learn from. One more slide about manifestation, uh, manifestations. It's also because I want to show there are loads of people that actually are, you know, they, they experience stigma and they learn how to deal with it. They overcome it in a certain way. They show their agency. They actually receive loads of support from families or others. So it's, uh, it's also part, it's also important to realize that sort of it's not, um, yeah, it manifests differently in different people. Uh, so this is a woman, um, 35 years old. Well, I do not know what I did was just taking the medicine. I resigned myself to God. That was all. Therefore, I did not feel shy or afraid. Um, I did not feel such feelings at all. If people befriended me, uh, I welcomed them. But if none of them wanted to do so, that was fine with me. So this woman, you know, she is, uh, there is some really inner strength in her, right? Uh, also, this man, very strong perseverance. At the time, many customers bought our yellow rice at school, but there was gossip that made that people did not want to buy our rice. But I never gave up. Even the food was left over. Next day, I kept selling the food. The gossip came again, but I kept selling the food. I sold my bicycle, my hands. I sold everything, but I never gave up, sir. If I had stopped, that meant I had lost. Finally, I could sell the food. Things went back to normal. I think if I had given up at the time, I would not have been selling food anymore. Yeah. So, it, you know, it shows what it, you know, it takes a lot from people. But there are these wonderful people that, um, uh, that are doing, yeah, that cope, right? And we can learn so much from these, you know, these people. And then there is this woman um, who has a very supportive husband. I also want to show sometimes there is stigma in the family and sometimes there is uh, loads of support and love. Uh, I suggested to my husband that he might want to leave me since I became black. Uh, so this is a, just a side note. 
people affected by leprosy, the moment they take medicine, uh, it can happen that their skin uh, darkens. So thanks to God that even though I suffered from leprosy and became black and dark, he, my husband, did not seem to have any evil wish to leave his black and wife. Not at all. He gave me his full support to get medication. He never tried to stay away from me. On the contrary, we became much closer to each other. So another nice example um, um, of support. Yeah. So this is part one that I wanted to you know, share some things about. The second part is about intersecting stigmas. So here I'm sharing the work of my PhD student. His name is Sergio Rai and Professor Ervanto was also involved um, as a PI. So we were both the PIs of this project. We didn't really have a name, but I liked Shared Lives. That's the name of the book um, that uh, Professor Ervanto um, has written about it. So that's just how I, it's the new title. Uh, Sergio's title of his thesis is very long, so I didn't put it here. Um, so one of, in one of his studies, he focuses on intersectionality. And um, yes, so the concept of intersectionality was first introduced by Kimberly Crenshaw in order to highlight the dynamics between race and gender and the overlapping oppressions that African-American women face as a result of such intersection. Uh, so what um, Sarju did, he interviewed people affected by leprosy, people with HIV AIDS, people with schizophrenia, and people with diabetes in Jakarta and West Java. And he had sort of long in-depth interviews um, talking about stigma due to these conditions but also talking in depth about how their gender, for example, influenced their experiences or how their religion influenced their experiences or whether they had a disability or not, or their sexuality or their age or whether there were any other conditions or their socioeconomic status, right? Really trying to get a very in-depth insight of how uh, things are interacted and how, how, you know, what kind of dynamics are going on. Uh, so he developed this very nice framework, I think. And it shows, yeah, it shows this, right? The parts of our identities, um, uh, it's just very important to be, aware, um, to be aware of this. It's something that I guess I missed a bit in our Sahari project. In Sahari project, uh, we, um, I mean, we did, of course, you know, we explored this a little bit, but not, in depth enough. So I was, um, uh, so this is a project sort of that I started after um, after the Sari project to pay more attention to this important aspect. Uh, so the results are written in this publication, uh, Hayat 2020. And I just wanted to show one, it's a very long quote. Um, um, it's a long story. Uh, I don't want to read it out loud, but it's about a person with HIV AIDS. Um, who identifies himself as a gay person. Uh, and he explained that because of his HIV AIDS, together added up with him being, you know, identifying himself as a gay person, also um, identifying or like um, as a Muslim, sort of this all sort of it influenced each other and it made uh, for him, uh, it worsened uh, the stigma he felt um, because of his condition. And um, yeah, so in, in the article, if you if you like to read more, uh, you can sort of uh, find other examples of how age or how um, gender or poverty sort of are, you know, um, influencing the situation, intersecting stigma. Um, and then culture. So the last point. Um, yeah, so one of the uh, facilitators in this uh, framework uh, was culture. And it's very difficult, right, to capture the influence of culture on stigma. And it's important because more and more researchers are, um, are saying, um, look, the, 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 the drivers of stigma, they, are, they differ per condition. But the manifestations, um, there's a lot of similarities between conditions. Um, so why not, why can we not sort of have tools, um, questionnaires and skills to assess health-related stigma instead of 
focusing on individual conditions every time. Why can we not develop interventions that actually um, target different types of stigma um, in one go, instead of focusing only on interventions uh, addressing leprosy-related stigma or HIV stigma or TB stigma? Um, why not uh, develop more generic approaches? Um, so I think there is a lot of, you know, there is opportunity there. I think we also need to be careful. Uh, we also need to be careful when we think about sort of whether we can uh, develop an intervention in one side and then implement it somewhere else. Because then, you know, the, the local context, we continuously need to think about the local context and about the culture. So that's why it's very important to have better, a better framework, have a better tools to understand the impact of culture on stigma. Um, so this is um, Professor Larry Yang. He is um, affiliated to New York University and he developed a framework um, to understand, to, sort of to, to understand the yeah, effects of the cultural context on stigma. Um, he and his colleagues um, um, say that by elucidating the interactions that matter most and that define full status within a cultural group can help us um, identify this um, um, effect of culture. It's a really nice framework. I'm going to tell a bit more about it. Um, and um, it has been applied, especially in the field of mental health, uh, but not, you know, not yet uh, in a lot of other conditions. Um, so it's a real privilege to be working together with him on a new project. Um, so two examples from his work. Um, one is, so because this what matters most, it's, sometimes it feels a bit difficult to, to yeah, what is, what is it, right? So I'm going to explain um, uh, a bit about Yang's work. So uh, in one of his studies, uh, they focused on understanding what matters most among Chinese American groups uh, with a mental health issue. And um, what they found, what matters most, was the preserv preservation of the family lineage. Yeah? Very important in this, um, um, you know, uh, in these groups. He also did a study in Botswana of what matters most, focused on HIV AIDS. And there they found that uh, what matters most is highly gendered. And that for women in Botswana, a core value was um, to become full, you know, full womanhood is achieved when they become a mother. And other important markers of personhood for a woman included getting married, um, respecting one's husband, bearing and raising children, and providing a strong moral foundation for the family. So this is what matters most. And um, it's, um, it are also this, those things that can be affected when somebody experiences stigma, right? It's, it's exactly this, it is sometimes uh, people um, uh, can no longer fulfill these rules or tasks, right? Um, and um, it can be at stake, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's one of so yeah. Um, let me explain some of the things that I really like about this framework. So one thing is the framework allows for an understanding of the behaviors of the stigmatized and the stigmatizers, um, I don't really, there's a problem with this word stigmatizers because some of them uh, also, they don't stigmatize, right? They observe or they include others actually. Um, but it's um, the what matters most framework. So we're exploring what matters most to people that have a stigmatized condition. And we're exploring what matters most to people that can potentially stigmatize. Um, because sort of, um, they are protecting something. Also people that stigmatize, they are protecting something else. And I think this is a very respectful way of trying to understand the sides of the potential stigmatizers. Sometimes it's too easy to blame, you know, it's, it's too superficial, I would say, or and easy to put blame on them if we don't understand um, the causes. And this framework I feel is a much more yeah, a respectful way um, of trying to understand uh, the dynamics behind um, stigmatizing and being stigmatized. Um, what I also like is that if we understand what matters most, we can 
it can help us to uh, develop new measures um, to uh, quantitatively assess uh, stigma. Uh, but then, uh, you know, culture will be on board more than I think is the case in current uh, stigma scales. And I hope that it will give us, you know, clues and recommendations for stigma reduction interventions. If we know which life domains are most important to people, which are at stake, which are threatened, uh, we can perhaps, you know, target interventions more into that direction, uh, hopefully having a bigger impact um, in the end. So that's why, yeah, we have this new project. Um, uh, and we are trying to explore what matters most in Indonesia, India, and Nigeria. I would, you know, be very curious to hear what you already, what you think that would matters most in Indonesia. Um, uh, but yeah, so the chat is not there, so we cannot, I cannot ask you to to leave and uh, to leave this answer in the chat. But um, yeah, very curious. Uh, so the project in the project will focus on three stigmatized conditions, leprosy, lymphatic filariasis, and depressive disorders. We'll be focusing on different uh, populations, people affected, family members, and health professionals. You now know why. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll have some results next year. And um, who knows, we meet each other again, and then I can share, or one of my colleagues uh, can share uh, the results of this uh, new project to you. So yeah, so this were, a quick recap, this is the framework I showed in the beginning, and we talked about these three different elements, the manifestations, intersecting stigmas, and a bit about these cultural norms. Um, and uh, I think it's time for the Q&A. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, Thank you. And then, yes. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, Thank I you. believe that that's in Cirebon, right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's in the warung, yeah, warung in Cirebon. Okay. Um, so, uh, Ruth uh, mentions about the project, yeah, and then Gyosi, uh, uh, our moderator, is one of the <laughs> one of the PhD students, yeah, that uh, joined that project, yeah. Hope that uh, we can learn more, yeah, from the results, yeah, from the your projects. Okay, so uh, question and answers, yeah. <clears throat> um, let me see. Mahfuz, yeah. So, um, My oh, Abdul, but oh, my name is Fikar from Magister Students of Mental Health, Community and Disability. This is our program, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm interested with this topic about stigma. In Indonesia, there has been a stigma that when we go to a psychologist, they will be said they will said that we are in the we are crazy people, yeah, crazy persons. In your opinion. How do you get rid of the stigma? And what should we do to combat the stigma that is a reform among the peoples in Indonesia? Hmm. I don't yeah. know, is it happens in the uh, Netherlands also? Yes, or? yes, of course, yes. So this is not, uh, yes, all over the world. I think, yeah, yeah, people with a mental illness are stigmatized. There might be a few exceptions, right? Sometimes we, we shouldn't generalize too much, right? Uh, because I know, yeah, there are probably a few exceptions. With leprosy, it's the same. All over the world, people with leprosy experience stigma. But there are a few communities where it's different. But um, yes, also in the Netherlands, uh, people with a mental illness are stigmatized. Uh, they sometimes conceal their illness because of this. Even health professionals sometimes working in the mental health sector are stigmatized by other health professionals, right? It's a, it's a very complex problem. And it's uh, difficult to solve. <laughs> There's not one solution. Um, um, what we know from our work uh, with leprosy is that a combination of, we need a combination of interventions. And ideally interventions that target different levels, right? So interventions to um, that address the needs of people with a mental illness themselves so that they, for example, if they want to speak up, if they want to 
uh, feel um, more confident. Uh, interventions like uh, counseling or peer. There's a very nice things uh, happening with uh, peers helping each other. Um, uh, that can help individuals and maybe families. Um, but then we need other interventions, right, to uh, address the stigma in um, the community. So I was involved in an intervention called contact. It's a contact intervention. It's one of the things that is, has proven to be effective. Um, so then uh, people in the community are brought into contact with people with a mental illness. Because sometimes people, they have all these ideas about people with a mental illness, which are um, based on what they've read in a newspaper or what they see in movies or just maybe stories they heard from their uh, grandparents or family members, right? It's in people's mind. And then, so it's sometimes just very important to meet people with a mental illness and to see, um, to hear, right? What is their story? What is their, their life story? And, and uh, often this, this confirms all the ideas, right? Uh, we hear people say, oh, uh, Right, I didn't, I didn't know this, and and so when they learn and meet each other, this can be really helpful. But it, it's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult for people with a mental illness sometimes to speak out uh, and uh, to create this meaningful dialogue, this meaningful interaction. Um, yeah, it takes time and efforts. Yeah. Also, there are, yeah, there are interventions needed at more policy level or organizational level. There are still laws and policies that are uh, stigmatizing uh, people with a mental health condition and other stigmatized conditions. So it's, uh, yeah, on all these levels, we need different things. Uh, and I, I say it's very important okay. to involve Thank people you. with a mental illness, you know, in the implementation and development of these interventions. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Fikar, uh, I just want to share uh, my experience. Yeah. So we have a health promotions university group. Yeah. And when we discuss about uh, mental health in university, yeah. So everybody said that in the beginning, yeah, when they make a counseling unit, yeah, so nobody wants to join that. But right now, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. And they have a long queue to make the uh, uh, to have a counseling uh, meetings, yeah. So and then like I, I, ITB, yeah, in ITB, yeah, they uh, ask a more psychologist to help because they don't have uh, any uh, psychologist uh, mm -hmm. faculty of psychology there, yeah, because they are technic. Uh, so they said that, and then it, it, it's also in UGM, University of Gajah Mada, also mentioned that. So I think for me. Uh, for the young people, young generations, yeah, and then educated people, I think they already rather change their mind about uh, going to the psychologist or psychiatry. Yeah, I hope so. Then I hope that the young generations can share it, yeah, to the older <laughs> people <laughs> like us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so maybe be a uh, bit by a bit it will change yeah we hope that yeah but things that we are crazy if we are good to okay. uh so um is that uh okay so we'll just uh, wait for another questions but i have mm -hmm. questions for you uh ruth yeah this is from uh, my experience uh with uh, people with hiv yeah uh mm -hmm. so if the stigma um related to religion religions yeah so it's rather difficult to to change their mind yeah instead of because they don't know they are afraid to uh, get the, the transmissions yeah from hiv such, such like that yeah because they don't understand yeah uh, the transmissions is very difficult right <laughs> yeah but uh, uh but if they think they make a stigma because it's a sin. They already make a sin, yeah, and then they got, uh, they, the God punished them. So it's really difficult to change their mind. Is it, uh, is it, uh, what is your uh, opinions about it? Is it true or not? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's true that it's difficult. Yeah, some of these causes of stigma are like deeply rooted in our yeah. how we are raised, right? And how we are uh, educated. And uh, our we are sometimes we're not even aware of it, right? It's all um, sometimes very implicit, right? So that's why some of the there are some there's some very nice work on implicit bias and some tests, right, that you can do to see if um, if yeah we all you know yeah um, yeah <laughs> it's it's very difficult yeah yeah I remember so I, a bit more about this implicit bias I did um so there's a test uh, university uh, Harvard University a group of uh, psych um, social psychologists they developed this uh, IA test and. Um, and it's really interesting. And I did it myself, right? Trying to, it's about um, whether I have a, a bias towards, for example, obese people and uh, more uh, um, not obese people. My, my, both my parents are obese. So I was really hoping I did not have it. But then unfortunately, you know, I'm, I'm also part of my... Uh, I'm also, you know, I, raise, I, I grow up in a society where I see media, where I read the newspaper, where I'm also confronted by um, these things. And, 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 and the religion, of course, it's, uh, it's what, you know, um, yeah, difficult, but it's not impossible, of course, but it's, uh, it's just a, a long road, I would say. Uh, a longer road. But there are, you know, there are also, um, having said that, um, you know, examples where change can happen fast, right? Where uh, um, with change agents, with uh, uh, famous people that speak up, uh, you know, really, you know, really great things can happen also quite soon. Uh, but it's, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And this, this is the questions uh, from Julie Rostina. She is, uh, she works with uh, people with HIV for 15 years. Okay. Uh, since I have worked in issues for HIV for many years, I found stigma does not have any great change in Indonesia, mm. even in health service. Based on our uh, own research in our foundation, most of people with uh, HIV face stigma in most aspects of their life. Yeah. Do you have any idea how to change it smoothly? Yeah, yeah, since it will affect uh, to disclosures. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what I can say is that what often happens is that people think if we have more knowledge, this will uh, uh, solve the issue. And that is not the case. Yeah. So what we need mm -hmm. is interventions. Knowledge is an important element. It's important to know how HIV spreads, right? It's important to know how other... So some knowledge is important, but we should... Um, not think that with knowledge alone, the issue is solved. So we need interventions with some knowledge elements, but it should be actually, a large part should be about something else. And uh, it could be this contact. It's about um, uh, meeting people. Uh, yeah. But... Um, yeah, so what I can say is it's not knowledge alone. And I think that's a mistake that is often made. Um, too much focus on knowledge. We should not forget knowledge, but it's uh, not the answer, not the key to the story. No. So um, maybe it's kind of like uh, like another study project, but it's not for, not for leprosy, but it's for uh, HIV. Is that right? Yes. Like that? that would be wonderful. So maybe, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But for the stigma, I think uh, I uh, I think uh, for your uh, new project about the uh, stigma, HIV is one of these, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So after this uh, uh, study, no, it's not. No, no, no. Sorry, Burita, it's not. It's. Uh, I was thinking about the one with Professor. Er so I we just finished the project oh, where it's... HIV was one of okay. the conditions. In what matters most, okay. it's uh, uh, depressive disorder, lymphatic filariasis, and. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, but maybe uh, Professor Irwanto can, can share it uh, when yes. uh, 
he has uh, he shared uh, his experience more experience HIV, yeah? yes exactly more experience with me with than uh, with hiv aids i think yeah okay so uh, there's another questions uh from ella yeah I would like to know if there is any stigma developed among adolescents who visit midwife or another healthcare worker just to have counseling for their reproductive health, such as vaginal discharge, menstruation problem, or a sexual activity. Because uh, there are found many adolescents afraid to be stigmatized uh, when they uh, yeah. Uh, they are pregnant by accidents, yeah, if they go to the midwife yeah. healthcare, yeah, and uh, here, uh, a sexual education is still taboo in here, in Indonesia, to, given, to be given in any schools, yeah, okay. Yes, so that's another topic, uh, another very interesting and important topic, right, um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I think, uh, again, all, maybe, you know, all over the world, uh, this is again an issue, um, sexual education is, um, yeah, there's sometimes, is it a boo, right? There is um, some element of shame or, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, so I think it's, uh, and it's very important, yeah, so, um, but also, yeah, so I'm not an expert on this, so we would need another research, a salary number three, <laughs> to, to understand this and to, um, yeah. But I, I, I agree, yeah, so, but what I know from literature, yes, it's an issue. All the topics um, she mentioned are important, uh, menstruation um, and, and uh, pregnancy, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, abortion also you know it can be stigmatized uh, and it's uh, yeah so there are all these topics related to sexual health um sexual and reproductive health yeah where stigma plays an important role yeah yeah i think a stigma for us in health promotion i think ibu ella is uh, one of the uh, our lectures in uh, beaver science mm -hmm. yeah so uh, we kind of like a stigma um je jeopardize our program Health intervention yeah. program, right? Because yeah. they are afraid, so they don't want to go. Yeah, yeah. they don't want to yeah. hear because it's stigma. Yeah. Okay. So maybe. Uh, yeah. it's so it would be really, yeah, it's very important to understand the reasons behind this. So you would need a qualitative research, perhaps, to talk to the and and to ex and to see what what can we change in the health promotion activities to make it more uh, addressing the needs or concerns of the the people involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good, okay. yeah. good yeah. work, <laughs> Ella. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is a question from uh, your old friends, uh, Eriando. <laughs> Yando. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Ruth. Nice to see you again. I would like to know more about your new project. Yeah. How can, while Indonesia is a multicultural country, with yeah. many different backgrounds. Do you, do you get uh, the what matter most while still uh, accentuating in the variety of cultures background? Does mm -hmm. the multicultural gonna result in different intervention strategy or reducing stigma? Yeah, so this is a uh, critical excellent question. question. <laughs> Very excellent question, Yando. <laughs> Uh, I don't see you on my screen, uh, um, uh, but it's wonderful uh, to get this question from you. Um, uh, and very good question. You know, the real story is that when I developed the proposal for what matters most, I thought along the same lines. So what I did is what I selected three study sites in Indonesia. Um, and I submitted a proposal to the committee. And then they said, this is a very interesting research route, but we would like you to include some other countries as well. So then we changed the proposal and we said, okay, 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 it's fair enough. It's also interesting to know uh, what matters most in some other settings. So that's when we included India and Nigeria and we had to reduce the number of settings in Indonesia. Yeah. And, um, and I, yeah, in a way, it's a pity because, of course, you know, uh, you know how much I like um, uh, working in Indonesia, and I and I and I totally agree. There is, you know, even three study sites in Indonesia would not have covered 
by far the richness of your country and culture. Um, but I did understand leprosy is an issue in still many countries, right? It's uh, Indonesia is one of them, but in India, there are many cases. Africa, there are still cases and it's quite a neglected continent. Not so much research uh, on leprosy is taking place there. So I did understand that point. So I did in the end include, um, change the proposal quite substantially. And now there's only one study site in Indonesia. But I, uh, yeah, I yeah. totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Thank you. Okay. So the next question is uh, from Yossi. I think the moderators also, uh, the, <laughs> the MC will also ask questions, yeah. So uh, what matter most is finding the most impactful area that help facility stigma, which hopefully based on this finding, we could develop a right interventions, yeah. What would be our opinion if what matter most is rather a dangerous or harmful traditional practice, mm. a long-lived hopeful belief where people are already comfortable with and used to the practice, yet have a direct impact to the persons. For example, child marriage, female genital mutilations, or mm. human sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, so uh, these are, yeah, uh, oh, it's a difficult question, <laughs> uh, but also important. Um, we haven't, so we, we've identified this issue in the project uh, and we haven't yet uh, talked in depth about this, right, uh, within the team. Uh, it's on our agenda actually to discuss this with um, Professor Larry Yang, because we like to hear his opinion about this. Um, um, yeah, so uh, I don't expect that this is what matters most, but it might be connected, you know, um, I think what matters most is something different, but as you saw with the Botswana case, uh, what matters most was uh, becoming a mother, and then there were these things connected to it. And uh, yeah, at some point, maybe, I, I don't know, in Indonesia, but maybe somewhere else, you can find indeed some cultural practices that matter a lot to people because of status or because of um, not losing face, right? Or, um, um, yeah, that are sensitive. Yeah, I don't know yet how we will deal with this. We will ask, you know, that's why we work with a diverse group of researchers and, and we involve people, uh, uh, so we will ask their advice and opinions. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah. Ruth, yeah, I think just uh, uh, ask her to make these questions as uh, her research questions. <laughs> That's for the dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ruth, for your uh, uh, experience yeah, about stigma. Yes. Thank yeah, you for and, having and, me. Uh -huh. And then uh, let's uh, move to Professor Irwanto. Yeah, he, he'll uh, share, you know, uh, his experience. Yeah, a lot of experience in mental health and disability in public health perspective. So the time is yours, Prof. Irwanto. Thank you, Rita. Hi, Ruth. How are you? <laughs> uh, could could you help me with the sharing my slides, uh, Rita? Uh, Ato Yossi, could you help me sharing oh. my slides? Sharing the slide. Sharing slide. Uh, 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 you asked me to... Okay. Bangga, yeah. can you uh, share uh, the slides of Prof. Iranto? I'm very technologically illiterate. <laughs> Same, Pak Iranto. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Rita asked me actually to present something on inclusion, but I go a bit further than that uh, so I do uh, reroute my thinking into disparities and in inequities and then going into inclusion at the end. Uh, I am a bit discouraged by the fact that there are a lot of data actually on disparities and equity and equality in health but I was not able to bring that up with you but that would also make the presentation very long. But 
uh, what I'm going to do uh, at, at this afternoon is to bring the issues, uh, hopefully uh, summarize it and then still capture the essence of the of the problem and then discuss uh, issues on inclusion. Okay, slide, first slide is the second slide, please. Yeah, I, I see Rita, is there Rita? Okay, nah. Okay. Nah. Uh, bangga. Okay, disparities in public health. Share screen, please. Huh? Oh. Sudah, 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 sudah. Uh, disparities in public health policy in Indonesia. Uh, I, I would like to ask all of you, the participants in this seminar, to look into the picture in my left and the left screen, uh, where uh, a, a, a young ad a, an adult, a bigger boy and a small boy, is trying to see uh, a game, uh, a golf, or whatever there is in uh, the other side of the fence. You know, the one is called equity, equality, where everybody is provided with the same facility. Uh, and the third one, and the second uh, picture is on equity, where uh, everybody is provided with uh, something uh, which is appropriate to uh, their limitations. Uh, so both are trying to help uh, people who may not be able to see the game without any uh, assistance, but uh, they're doing it differently. If you uh, assist people on a equality basis, there are a lot of people, especially people uh, who has been marginalized for a long time, that may not be able to enjoy their rights anyway, uh, because they have been too deeply uh, isolated. So you need uh, more uh, uh, more than just providing op equal opportunity. There should be action yeah, that uh, help you uh, according to whatever that you need to be able to enjoy your rights. So it's a different concept and a very important concept too. And uh, this has been uh, taught and written by Armatiasi, Arma Amartya, Amartya Zen, Amartya Zen, the Nobel laureate in economics, in, in health economics. I see disparity in public health policy in Indonesia. Uh, the main problem has been this three uh, uh, issues. One is over investment in hospitalization. Second is lack of investment in prevention medicine. And the third has been disparities in investment in mental and physical health. Uh, plus two other uh, problems that affect uh, the public health policy. One is unequal distribution across region, across district, across socioeconomic status. And then uh, also the failure of the government system, of the governance system, and engaging community. So with all these reasons, I would like to go with you one by one. Next. I think that's been three decades now that WHO promote this uh, uh, concept of health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of, of disease or infirmity. But in practice, in, in public policy practice, uh, even WHO cannot control uh, the disparities that is happening uh, in uh, most countries, uh, even in, in, in developed countries, uh, and of course most severely in low-income and middle-income countries, where investment has been driven not only by needs, of the country, but by something else, yeah? by interest group, by uh, agenda of the bank, and things like that. In public policy around the world, 
disparities of investment in physical and other elements of of uh, health and well-being is very serious. Trillions of US dollars are invested in hospitals and biomedical technologies, uh, and, but neglecting preventive medicine and mental health seriously, uh, which then well, they trail behind uh, and maybe not only trailing behind, but neglected. Next, please. In uh, 2020, uh, the Fierce Healthcare reported that uh, because of COVID, uh, investors doubled down their health technology investment uh, to uh, 9.1 billion US dollar, which is 19% increase, uh, partly to response to uh, COVID-19. But even that much money is spent, uh, they are spending it more on the technology for uh, uh, vaccine and and and, and uh, medical other medical uh, uh, technology than to support people uh, who are suffering a lot from uh, stress and isolation. The World Bank. Uh, Please note this one, the World Bank, I think this is from 2011, uh, has long indicated that many modern health technology uh, were purchased by developing countries, but were not used. So many uh, medical uh, technology purchased by low and middle income country are basically uh, unused and and stay in, in, the, in the hospital, not creating any income, not able to create return of investment at all. But uh, the worst is that uh, these technology are paid by full, by the debtors, by the, by the countries. There's uh, whatever reason, the World Bank charge in full to the debtors. Uh, Lanjut. Consequently, yeah, uh, all the cost of this very expensive technology has to be borne by the patients, has to be borne by the community. So uh, the, the use, utilization of medical technology, uh, which is uh, to actually uh, make the services uh, health services more efficient and more and less costly, but it becomes costly because they are not used, and many are not used uh, for uh, reasons like uh, not only not only because that they do not they are not able to use that, but some might be of political reasons. For example, in Indonesia, uh, we have a genetic machine to actually. Uh, help people uh, to have uh, a, a more accurate uh, uh, estimate of TB uh, in Indonesia. But if you use the uh, Gen X machine, you will get much higher number of people infected by TB and infected by non-curable TB. Uh, that number makes politicians uh, shocked and afraid, and therefore a lot of, 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 of machine, genetic machine, are not used in Puskesmas. Uh, they use the, the manual uh, and, and the uh, business as usual, usual tool, you know. So uh, the technology is not used, not because they don't, they're not able to uh, deal with it, but said, uh, most of the time there are other reasons to actually not use it. So the, the problem is uh, the public, uh, the community, they don't know about that. But then they have to pay the cost. They have to pay uh, because uh, uh, the uh, state uh, will charge uh, people through taxes and through other means, uh, which at the end of the day, 
will go through our pockets. Okay, lanjut. The, 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 the second uh, serious uh, problem, issues that in our country is that we have so many uh, preventable diseases that can be prevented and might uh, help us to live longer and to live in, 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 in a better quality of life. Uh, but right now, uh, after 75 years of, 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 of independence, so-called, uh, and after uh, two, uh, let's say, economic reform, big reform, Indonesia still have to face stunting. Something which, which can be preventable. Uh, not only that, we still have uh, mothers who are, who are anemic. Uh, uh, and also, uh, we still have to supply uh, our community with iodine, vitamin C, vitamin A, iron. Uh, we need also uh, to uh, improve uh, services to uh, uh, diagnose and, and also to treat malaria, TB, other resp respiratory diseases, and intestinal infections. These are all curable, uh, basically preventable, but because of uh, water sanitation and hygiene, uh, which is not uh, controlled and, and not being promoted very well, uh, communities still suffer all of this, uh, even in the, the richest area uh, in the Republic. Jakarta, for example, uh, the kota, daerah kota, the, the uh, central Jakarta, uh, full of rich people over there, but water sanitation is very, very, very bad. Uh, and also, uh, of course, uh, uh, healthy right, uh, lifetime promotion is not being conducted. We know that our food has been poisoned, poisoned so much. Even now, our children has to uh, has to to be uh, has to bring their own food from home if you want your, your children to be safe in school. Because if, we, if you let your children uh, uh, purchase food in school, they might be exposed to unhealthy foods, and uh, somehow. The policy, the law, uh, has uh, been uh, ineffective to, to deal with that. Again, and then, of course, the so psychosocial and mental health support. This is something which we know as developing countries. Uh, we know that as a community that is evolving very fast, that is developing very fast, that uh, people are going to be go through conflict, uh, deal with poverty here and there, but psychoso psychosocial and mental health support is very much neglected. And if you look at the structure in the Department of Health, uh, this, uh, this is only a directorate, not even a department, only a directorate uh, uh, which are, are managed by no more than six or seven uh, uh, doctors there. So this is a shame to me, but still uh, uh, this is the fact uh, uh, that uh, especially psychosocial and mental health uh, support has been marginalized for so, for so long. Uh, the law has been uh, instituted only six years ago, uh, but then the program, the ministry uh, uh, Ministry, the relevant ministry, uh, uh, apa namanya? regulations uh, are, has not yet been uh, formulated. So a lot like uh, uh, standard for care and outside uh, facilities uh, and outside health facilities has only very recently in place. But then it's not yet, uh, it's not yet, uh, Evaluated, yeah, whether uh, the standard of care outside of of of, of health service of of health 
uh, services has been meeting uh, the highest and the safest standard for care and, and support. Lanjut. Ya, yeah, ini tadi sudah, uh, I mean, uh, marginalization of all kinds of mental health support and treatment itu uh, basically has affected thousands of people. Yeah. Uh, as you know, uh, the, the Human Rights Watch uh, criticized uh, uh, our ministries of health uh, since like 10 years ago or maybe more uh, because the quality uh, of uh, mental health treatment and support uh, is very, uh, was a very, very uh, unacceptable, yeah? not, not even bad, it's unacceptable. And uh, that still is going on until today. Uh, uh, I know that uh, the government is trying uh, hard to uh, deal with this issue, but I think it's uh, still not enough. I think uh, more investment should still be there. Uh, this cannot be solved by legislation. They, they cannot be solved by political uh, commitment alone. Uh, there are a lot that needs to be built, the infrastructure, the, uh, the human resources, uh, the uh, chain, uh, supply chain of medical supply, and all those uh, needs to be improved uh, immediately. But again, uh, if you look at uh, when the report has been uh, Britain, uh, I think it, it's already now six years and not, no significant uh, advancement or progress has been made. Uh, and my own work uh, with my colleague, uh, also with a uh, psychiatrist from UI, we still find, easily find 140 people in shackles like this in Timur and in and, and, and East uh, Nusa Tenggara Timur. So, uh, situation is really uh, bad. Uh, this reflects two things. One is, of course, uh, lack of visions and the importance of mental health uh, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, physical health. If we believe in the, in the WHO definition, mental health is as important uh, as physical health. Uh, and maybe uh, more important because mental health makes you feel uh, happier or healthy even though you may have diseases. Uh, but because you do not attend to this aspect of health, uh, people are more suffering uh, from the conditions rather than appreciating what they can do about it. And second is uh, the, the condition reflects also the failure of the government to uh, control uh, its policy, to uh, make sure that in implementing their policy, the community should not only be treated only as beneficiaries. Community should be treated as partner. Community has to be given uh, a space to criticize, to also involved in uh, improving uh, the quality of care. So uh, community is not only uh, the object of policy. Uh, community should also be involved as the subject of policy uh, implementation. Next. Yeah, this is just uh, an example where during COVID, we know unmet needs uh, of, is very obvious. Uh, we don't have uh, comprehensive data yet on uh, incidents of mental health, especially serious one, but we suspect that there are a lot of uh, mental health issues that has been worsened uh, uh, during this COVID-19 uh, social distancing. But to, my, to me, it's not just the general population, but what about the marginalized population? 
including children uh, who are already marginalized. For example, if uh, one of the NGO that works with me on uh, uh, child protection is Bandungwangi. Bandungwangi try to uh, identify children who are already in exploitative uh, situation. They have been sold to the sex industry. What happened with them during COVID? Uh, they try to understand, do they receive any benefits from the command source? Do they uh, receive any help from uh, NGOs or uh, social uh, organizations? The answer is no. They have been stigmatized. Uh, they were even pushed by their parents to still uh, provide service for their clients. So basically, these children are pushed uh, to, 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 to the most dangerous limit to, inf to, to be infected themselves by COVID-19. Uh, that's the fact. Uh, and if, if our leader do not know where they are and who they are, uh, the, the, the likelihood of them being totally neglected is really uh, very significant. Lanjut. Yeah, this is also just number uh, because of lack of investment in, uh, apa namanya, in, in uh, mental health and psychosocial support. 75% of people with mental health, neurological and substance disorder do not receive uh, adequate treatment. Uh, we talk a lot about this stigma, discrimination and punitive legislation. But uh, I think when we talked about policy, uh, this is something that the government can do. Uh, the problem is the government is very, uh, apa ya, apa ya? it looks like the government has a split personality on this. Yeah. On the one hand, you hear people, progressive people, trying to uh, deal with stigma and discrimination, but still inside uh, uh, lembaga uh, and kementerian, uh, you still see practices that discriminate people. Uh, and, 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 and during the COVID area, uh, one uh, institution uh, is, uh, I think, Kejaksaan Agung, I think, who recruit uh, uh, new uh, prosecutor. And, and the requirement uh, to uh, apply for the job, uh, they have to prove themselves that they are not member of LGBT. So how could uh, the law uh, protect uh, people uh, uh, with social minority status if uh, the office who has mandated for protection do not understand their mandates? Lanjut. Additional problems, yeah. government delivery and failure. This because because a lot of a lot of programs in the government, if not controlled, if not well controlled, especially not well controlled by the people by DPR, they are going to be driven by political interest or by economic interest of small groups of powerful people. Uh, that's the fact. Uh, for example, Depsos, the mandate is very clear for uh, uh, for Bansos, for uh, social uh, charity. Uh, but you know what happened? Uh, then the, 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 the money for social charity has been manipulated by a group of people uh, for their own pockets and maybe uh, to contribute to their own parties. Something like that. And then this is something that is unforgivable, uh, but it happens in our country. Uh, uh, so uh, programs uh, becomes, not becomes program for people, but programs for opportunity cost for the bureaucrat. Uh, the result, of course, is skewed benefit. Only very few people benefit from the program. Uh, the large, larger population cannot benefit from the program 
because it's been uh, designed not to fit uh, for uh, to, 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 to deal with their needs. In mental health, uh, of course, government has uh, failed to control quality of community engagement, no standard of care, uh, and I've, I've uh, uh, explained this uh, 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 a few minutes ago. Yeah, lanjut. Oke, okay, lanjut lagi. Ya, ini uh, I just give you the uh, apa uh, uh, the definition here. Oke. Okay. Now the, the the problem with uh, inclusion. How are we how are we going to uh, support inclusive policy? This is my theory. Yeah, this is my theory. Uh, and 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 uh, policy implementation or policy analysis book. There is one article which is to me uh, a very naughty article, but very true. Uh, people, uh, the, the writer said that uh, poverty will not be uh, overcome because leaders do not like to solve uh, uh, problem of poverty. Leaders play with poverty issue for their own benefit, but they actually are not investing anything to uh, deal with poverty head on. The problem is about choices. If uh, a leader choose uh, to receive the mandate and to deal with the mandate accordingly, then they need to change the uh, bureaucratic culture. The bureaucratic culture and most ministry in Indonesia is politically driven. So if a, if a minister, for example, like the Ministry of Social Affairs, would like to serve the poor, they need to change the bureaucracy first to agree with that. Otherwise, when the ministry is doing things to actually choose uh, activities and programs that deal with poverty, uh, uh, they are not getting the support. Uh, uh, people will accuse him or her as uh, propaganda, as as other things than actually being serious with the, with the mandate. So basically, it is only possible inclusion happening if the leadership in the political sector agree to deal with the mandate and in line with that and the implementation rather than playing with politics which is uh, like an everyday business in their uh, uh, in their appointment uh, as a public uh, leader okay mungkin hanya itu uh, i think it's very broad but you you see my point uh, it's it's really hard to to deal with inclusive uh, development uh, because people would like to see more anis uh, more orang-orang korup itu dibanding dengan orang-orang yang sungguh-sungguh kerja gitu ya yeah, thank you Rita thank you Yosi Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Irwanto. Uh, so I just want to share you that uh, in in this morning, yeah, I was uh, appointed to the dean to uh, join the focus group discussion from Ministry of Welfare, yeah, and uh, they talk about uh, um, wants to put inclusions uh, for the uh, disability peoples, and also will increase the index of social welfare for, for them yeah because you know uh, the ministry of uh, social welfare already changed yeah <laughs> with ibu risma yeah mm. so they just uh, want to uh, rearrange again and then um, put more attention to the disability and elderly yeah yeah okay maybe um, maybe it's a, a new hope for us <laughs> pak irwanto okay uh, so uh, questions Yeah. 
I remind you also yeah, that in, in the Department of Social Affairs, some of the directorates still hold the name uh, of the marginalized uh, person. Uh, directorat, uh, uh, directorat, uh, apa? Uh, selain pelacur itu apa sih disebutnya? Pokoknya masih, uh, most of them are still using stigmatized a name oh. for the directorate. Uh, uh. Yeah. So they, they okay. need to change the, the bureaucratic culture. Yes, but we, yeah, we uh, we hope that uh, she can make it. <laughs> yeah. I hope. Okay. Uh, so this is the questions. Yeah, this is a yeah. questions. Uh, Prof. Irwanto, community should not be only an object, but also a subject of a policy. Yeah, I agree on this, uh, Prof. Where or what practices would be the opportunity for the community member? as an individual or group to being as an active part of creating an inclusive uh, community. Yeah, so. Oh. Yeah, I think Mas Bagus is still with us. Mas Bagus, uh, you can talk a lot about the uh, current uh, uh, affair at the Ministry of Health, where community groups, affected community groups, has been asked to uh form like uh, 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 community groups uh, to actually uh, be partner rather than beneficiary of the government to criticize to bring evidence that the policy works or don't work mas bagus bisa cerita mas Pak, maaf Pak, ini webinar Pak, jadi oh, uh, ya gak bisa ya di mute semua ya chat kalau mau mas bagusnya boleh yeah. chat di sini nanti kita bacakan oke okay, oke okay. Okay, that's my answer. So yeah. actually, actually, uh, there are some practices already in place. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Oh, here. Yeah. Gimana, Mas Bagus? Okay. Uh -huh. Silakan, Pak. Iya, sa. Kalau uh, saya di komunitas peduli schizophrenia memang selama ini. Uh, ya cukup dilibatkan lah untuk untuk uh, memberi masukan kepada pemerintah gitu uh, khususnya di tahun-tahun uh, antara 2013 2014 uh, sampai 2016 lah tetapi setelah itu kan agak slowing down nih undang-undang oh. kesehatan jiwa diresmikan ya follow up-nya undang-undang uh, tersebut uh, agak mandek gitu bukan enggak mandek ya memang mandek ya yeah. akhirnya uh, kita uh, berusaha mengubah strategi kita mencoba menguatkan uh, teman-teman KPSI di beberapa daerah yang kemudian mereka berusaha mengadvokasi kebijakan-kebijakan di tingkat daerah gitu. Terus juga memberi masukan apakah layanan ini kira-kira sudah memenuhi kebutuhan uh, masyarakat gitu. Nah, namun uh, adanya kesenjangan nih antara Undang-undang uh, Kesehatan Jiwa dan undang apa uh, RPP turunannya aturan-turunan turunannya ini yang yang sampai sekarang belum ya, ada yang jadi. berhasil gitu ya dilahirkan itu mengakibatkan juga uh, pengembangan layanan atau sistem kesehatan jiwa kita juga mengalami stagnasi ini okay, kalau menurut okay. saya. Gitu. Thank you, thank you, Mas Bagus. Yeah, I, I also mentioned that actually uh, one important strategy is to integrate uh, mental health and psychosocial services in school. Uh, Rita has mentioned that it's beginning to, to happen, but it's, it's much too late actually 
we need to have uh, mental health support in school. Like in my university, for example, in the past six years, there has been three cases of suicide. Uh, and uh, still, until, until today, we do not have a significant mental health support. Uh, and uh, other than that, there are also setbacks, like in, in the field of narcotics, and in the field, especially not narcotics, uh, but HIV AIDS. Uh, the National Committee uh, uh, for HIV and AIDS, Na National Committee for HIV and AIDS, has been able to bring affected community uh, uh, to sit actually equally uh, in the office of the committee and to contribute to policy undertaking. But right now, say 19, uh, 2017, because of the new presidential instruction, uh, their role has been stripped out. And actually, uh, most community, affected community group has no place to, to actually voice their concerns and uh, uh, feedback to government policy. So we are actually uh, uh, suffering setback a lot in community participation. Yeah. Um, it's a difficult situation, Pak Iranto, but uh, we hope that uh, uh, in uh, our um, majors, yeah, because uh, it's under the health promotions, so empowerment is uh, very yeah. important, yeah. So maybe um, the students can, after they graduate, they can become uh, a good uh, advocator, yes. yeah, for the yeah. yes. <laughs> for the policy makers, yeah? And then uh, include also uh, the infected community, yeah? yeah. So, uh, sorry, the affected community, yeah? To, to so uh, no one left behind. So they, they also can uh, give uh, and share their needs, yeah? What they need, yeah? But I also agree, Pa Erwanto, that um, usually people from um, the Ministry of Health or Social Welfare, you see, they just kind of like allergic with the uh, the angles or the community, yeah. Because usually they they think that uh, they are uh, too critical, yeah. But yeah. Uh, we need that, yeah, to change uh, their mind and then also their interventions. That actually the interventions is uh, not match with their um, their needs. I think, yeah. So um, we hope that we can make this uh, Prof. Irwanto in our uh, major, ma uh, major majors, yeah? yeah? In our new uh, majors. Okay, um, is there uh, any questions? Okay, so if uh, there's no uh, questions, uh, Pak Irwanto, do you want to give a closing statement uh, for uh, these seminars? As we know that uh, in the first yeah. uh, speakers, yeah, uh, Prof. Yeah. Charis already yeah. make uh, uh, presentations about the health promotions in mental health, and we know that it's very complex, yeah. And also after that, uh, stigma, yeah, stigma uh, that uh, Dr. Roots already mentioned uh, for us, yeah, about the stigma. And then the stigma is uh, can jeopardize our program, yeah? yeah. And the last one, uh, Prof. Irwanto already mentions yeah. uh, the more brothers, uh, and they, he talks about the in, uh, inclusions community. Yeah, that it's yes. uh, maybe just it's, one thing. But, yes. Okay. Maybe just one thing. I, I would like to say something like this: uh, mm -hmm. if we if we serious about SDG. Uh, mm -hmm. Our time has left like like ten years from now, right? Uh, or nine years from now, uh, by 2030, we have to achieve FDG. Uh, and for that, we need to fight for like let's say right now, 11 percent or six percent mm -hmm. of our population who are still living in poverty. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I I suspect that uh, the the crust or the core of uh, population living in poverty in Indonesia right now is mostly because of marginalization. It's not economics anymore. It's economic plus, 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 uh, uh, so that they, uh, uh, they hide themselves 
they do not access services because of self-stigmatization and things like that. Uh, unless we deal with them uh, according to, let's say, human nature, let's say, that we, are, mm -hmm. we fail to actually uh, say hello to them, please come out, like Burisma, please come out, go with me. Mm -hmm. If we fail to do that, it's not going to change anything because basically they don't want the government. I interviewed one uh, Grobak uh, father uh, whose uh, girl was ill uh, and it was raining like today, raining. And I asked the father, why don't you bring your daughter to Puskesmas? He said, no, if I, if I bring my daughter to Puskesmas, I will not be, uh, uh, they will not uh, uh, come to me because we are orang miskin, I don't have KTP. So I, rather than a shame yeah. and sakit hati, and Puskesmas, I'd rather buy pills uh, and in the store and, and, and treat my own uh, child. So the, 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 the problem is that serious, you know. So again, uh, from my perspective, uh, I do uh, ask a lot of the current leadership uh, because they are the driver of the resources that is available or made available by the state. Yeah, uh, of course, private sector is good, community is good, uh, but the main uh, driver of pro-poor program is still the government. So we need more sensitive government. We need uh, uh, more pro, uh, pro-poor government uh, that uh, are not afraid to take risk. Yeah, it aja. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I hope that uh, from uh, this um, majors, yeah, from our um, majors yeah. in uh, mental health com and community and disability, we hope that uh, the students can become that uh, kind yeah. of person, yeah, Pak Iria. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> okay, because oh, we are not uh, giving uh, the knowledge about how to treat in details, yeah, mm -hmm. mental health, yeah, and also about disability, yeah, mm -hmm. which is, but it's more the change the perspective and it more broader, yeah, about the intervention and so on. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I think uh, this is a very nice uh, discussion, yeah, and hope that uh, the seminars can uh, broaden our perspective and then uh, we can uh, be more. Uh, empathize yeah with the people with disability with mental health yeah and then uh, we also uh, uh, have a philosophy that no one left behind yeah okay and uh, thank you very much uh, to professor Irwanto for the nice uh, and inspiring uh, presentations and I give it back to uh, Yossi thank you Thank you, uh, Dr. Rita, and all the speakers, Professor Sharon Burns, uh, Professor Irwanto, and Dr. Peters for a very wonderful session of the webinar. And I'd like to also thank for all the participants that are staying with us today and those of you uh, who gave questions throughout the webinar. For all participants, uh, please do not forget to fill the attendance form, uh, tiny.cc slash presenti seminar online six. And if you uh, would like to rewatch or share this webinar, you can do so by accessing the record of this webinar through our faculty YouTube at ITFKMUE. And you can also uh, share your thoughts and leave your experiences with the presentation in the comment box there. And please also join the Instagram of our faculty at fkmue-ue, fkm-ue, that will give you updates on uh, the upcoming events. I would like to also share to you again that the Faculty of Public Health University of Indonesia has a community mental health and disability major under the Department of Health Education and Behavioral Science. So this brings us to the end of today's webinar. Uh, we sincerely appreciate your attention today. Please stay healthy, stay safe, and please always follow the COVID-19 health protocol. And on the behalf of the community, uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.